Hey there everybody, Sage of Popham here, founder of the School of Evolutionary Herbalism, and welcome back to The Plant Path. And uh, I've got an episode here talking about something that I think is really, really, really important here in modern herbal medicine and uh, just continuing to share kind of some of the foundational perspectives and orientations that we have here at the School of Evolutionary Herbalism. And today talking about the concept and practice of vitalism and what I see as being the importance of being able to learn directly from nature and practice in accordance with how nature functions. And you know, when I say that, it's really easy for people to think of nature as like the mountains and the forests and the fields and the meadows and like, you know, the nature out there. And that's a part of it for sure. But I'm also talking about the nature in here, like the nature that is your body. You know, traditional systems of herbal medicine have a way of understanding people that is really based on us being a microcosm of the natural world, that we aren't like in the modern kind of more scientific reductionistic model, kind of we see the body as like a machine, like a bunch of gear, like biochemical gears. Um, whereas, you know, traditionally the body is seen as a reflection of the earth, right? That we have the mountains are in our bones and the rivers are flowing through our bloodstream and our kidneys and the ocean is in our lymphatic system and, you know, the mist is in our lungs and, right, there's all these different ways of seeing our body as a reflection of nature. And this is really what I'm talking about when I'm looking at the, the concept and principles of vitalism and and learning from nature and to me this is a central concept in the practice of truly holistic herbal medicine so you know i think one of the first kind of goals that we have as herbalists or maybe not goals but things that we need to always keep in mind um, is part of kind of like that Hippocratic Oath, right? Which is first and foremost, do no harm. And, uh, you know, I think, you know, without trying to put modern medicine down too much, because I do think it has a lot to offer. It is unfortunate though, that it seems like that part is sometimes forgotten because it's very common for people to become more sick or sick in different ways to be harmed by misuse or abuse of, um, of a lot of modern medicines. And What's even more unfortunate though sometimes is that herbalists thinks that sometimes can think that they're immune to this, meaning that we can't do harm with plants, that all the medicinal plants are just good and safe and everyone should be taking all of them all of the time because they're great for everyone. And it's unfortunate because um, that is definitely not true and we can actually unfortunately um, create imbalances within people if we don't select the correct herbal medicines. And this is a very common thing that happens in the allopathic approach to herbal medicine. That's right. I said the allopathic approach to herbal medicine. There is such a thing as allopathic herbalism. And uh, this was something that was like, I realized, you know, myself, because in my journey on my plant path, you know, I came to a point where I realized that I was practicing allopathic herbalism and I didn't even realize it. I thought that just because I'm, I'm using herbs, so I'm holistic, right? And I think that's a really common mindset that people have. I use herbs or homeopathics or supplements, therefore I'm holistic. And it's unfortunately not true that the practice of holistic medicine isn't dependent on what kind of remedy you're using. It's dependent on how you use the remedies you use. That holistic practice is before practice, it's a perception. It's a way of seeing things. It's a way of understanding the people you're working with, the plants that you're utilizing, and then ultimately how you are administering those remedies. And so what we see is in, in myself, you know, I was working with clients when I was just starting to see clients, like in my early 20s, and uh, I was having some great results with, with the herbs with some people. But in other people, 
the herbs weren't working. And I thought I was giving all the right remedies, the herbs you should give, right? Uh, you know, someone has a headache. So, oh, well, you know, they say willow bark is good for a headache and it didn't always work. Or, oh, this person's got a bunch of inflammation and joint pain. So we'll give them turmeric because uh, turmeric's good for joint pain. Or we'll give valerian to the person that can't sleep because valerian's good for people that can't sleep. You see the pattern? The good for mindset, right? What And this is like the thing everyone asks, what's the herb good for? And I, I just feel like sometimes that's a wrong place to start when it comes to studying herbs. It really should be, you know, who is that herb? You know, what is the, 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 what are the core properties and virtues of that herb? And uh, we're going to talk, I'm going to talk about that in a, in a future kind of uh, little post episode here in this kind of intro to evolutionary herbalism series I'm doing for you here for all the new folks that are uh, kind of new to our world. But the, the, the point that I'm trying to make here is that the, the common use this herb for that symptom kind of mindset is leads you kind of down what I call the allopathic herbalism trap. It leads to a certain way of thinking about people and about plants and about giving people plants that honestly doesn't always work because we don't we don't treat symptoms or diseases with medicinal plants right that might be another like wait what right yeah we don't we don't treat symptoms or diseases with plants we treat people right we give herbs to people that have symptoms and diseases and health problems but when we tunnel in on the name of the, di the disease, on the superficial symptom, and we lose sight of the whole person, um, we kind of start to go down a pathway that can, that can lead us into brambles and uh, um, what, what my son calls the pokies, you know, like all the sticker bushes and we can, can get off track um, in our approach to herbal medicine. And this is where, in contrast to that allopathic approach, to me, the vitalist approach to herbal medicine is where we really start to return to a more holistic model of looking at the whole person, of understanding you know, the total global property of the plant rather than, oh, willow's good for a headache. Well, why is willow good for a headache? And more importantly, what type of headache is willow good for, right? Because there's many different types of headaches. There's occipital headaches and temporal headaches and there's migraines and there's, you know, what we might refer to as like a deficiency or cold kind of headache or like an excess hot headache. There's a tension headache. Well, willow is gonna be really great for some of those and not so good for others of those, right? And so there's a, there's a specific specificity and how we work with people and plants in a holistic model that ultimately really determines your success as an herbalist. And so the vitalist approach is, you know, vitalism, right? Like, what does that even mean? Well, vitalism is a, is a, it's an approach. It's a way of seeing things that recognizes that there is an intelligence in nature. There is an intelligence in the human organism. There is an intelligence in a plant. And that our goal as a vitalist herbalist is to follow that intelligence, is to follow the nature of things <clears throat> and to practice in a way that is really uh, working with the, the energy of the system that's working with the flow of vitality in the organism. Basically, we're working with the body, not antithetical to the body. And vitalism also recognizes that it, it's a specific approach. So it recognizes that you might have three people with the same symptom or the same disease, but you might treat those people totally differently because perhaps they're expressing that disease slightly differently, or they have the same symptom, but the underlying root cause behind that symptom is very different. And one of the ways that vitalism does this is through um, understanding what in herbalism we refer to as energetics. So. Don't let the red flags go up for those of you that might be a little, you know, not super into woo-woo concepts. Energetics is not a woo-woo thing, right? This is a very pragmatic approach where we're looking at the qualities of 
the symptom and the qualities of a plant that really is, again, based on nature. It's based on kind of ecology and weather in a sense. So systems of energetics, which show up cross-culturally all over the world in herbal traditions, east, west, north, and south. So we're looking at the temperature of the disease or the plant. Is it hot or cold? Looking at the moisture qualities, is it moistening or is it drying? Uh, we're looking at kind of the tonal quality. Is a tissue in a person overly tense and like spasmodic or is it kind of loose and apathetic and overly relaxed? And so we're looking at these energetic qualities what's behind the symptom. So a really great example of this is like take a cough, right? If you've ever had a cough or been around people that have a cough, we know there's like different types of coughs, right? So if you were to say, okay, someone has a cough and we wanna give them an herb for their cough. Well, most herbal books will say, okay, um, the type of herb that you need for a cough is called an expectorant. And an expectorant is what facilitates, you know, in the cough reflex, it makes a cough more productive and it just helps expel phlegm and mucus from the lungs and respiratory tract. They're the cough herbs, right? And in that list of expectorants, you might see some herbs such as licorice root or glyceriza glabra, marshmallow root or Althea officinalis. You might see um, elecampane or inula helenium. You might see um, osha root, logisticum porteri. You might see something like lobelia or lobelia inflata. Um, all in that same list. And so from an allopathic perspective, we would say, oh, these are all herbs good for a cough. So we'll just pick a few of the herbs, put them in a formula, we call a kitchen sink formula or a shotgun formula, you know, and give it to the person and hope it works. And I always say, you know, hope's a really good thing. Uh, it's good to hope for good things and to strive to work towards goodness. But when you give someone an herb, herbal formula, you don't wanna just hope it's gonna work. You wanna be able to hand that remedy to someone and have confidence that it's going to work. And um, so I think we can do better than hope when it comes to giving people herbs. And this is because those herbs in that list I just mentioned are very, very different plants because that treat very different types of coughs. So, you know, we have, thinking of energetics, we have coughs that tend to be sometimes really hot and inflamed and really dry, right? Well, if you were to give someone like OSHA uh, to that person, uh, that's gonna aggravate that cough because OSHA is a very warming and a very drying plant. Um, if you were to give that same person some marshmallow root, that's gonna be wonderful. It's demulsin, it's soothing, it's cooling, it's gonna moisten the mucosa and it's gonna kinda help calm down that heat and moisten that dryness. Conversely, someone can have a really cold phlegmatic cough, right? Really cold and damp and they're just, you can hear all of the mucus and phlegm in their lungs and they're coughing up just globs of, you know, thick white mucus or clear mucus, right? Well, OSHA in that situation is gonna be fantastic, right? Because it's very warming and drying. It's gonna break up that mucus and get help get it out, right? Um, if you give marshmallow to the person with the really cold phlegmatic cough, boy, it's gonna be really aggravating to their condition. So this is where vitalism is really, really important. So we're looking at the vital force within their organs and their tissues and the systems of the body. We're looking at what's the pattern behind the symptom, right? What's the pattern behind the symptom? And then we're looking at what's the pattern behind why the herb is good for that condition, right? So it's, so you see how there's kind of like a superficial take of like, they have a cough, these herbs are good for cough allopathic herbalism. Vitalist says, what kind of cough is that? What's the specific nature of the cough? What's the nature of the person with the cough? And why is that these herb, why are these herbs good for a cough? What type of cough are they remedial for? And now we're not just giving the herb for the symptom, we're matching the pattern in the plant 
to the pattern in the person. And this is where we get so much more specific in our remedy selection and ultimately where we become just simply more uh, effective in our application of herbal medicine because we are uh, addressing fundamental core root issues, root imbalances within the body of which the symptom is but kind of like the, the superficial expression. You know, in, in a vitalist approach, the symptom is not the enemy, right? And it's really easy to think that symptoms are the enemy, right? That, you know, because they, because they, well, they kind of suck, right? It's like the symptom is what makes you feel crappy. You know, no one likes having the headache and no one likes having the cough and no one likes having the burning UTI or no one likes being constipated. Like symptoms are what make us feel bad, obviously. Um, and an allopathic approach is like, take the symptom away, right? We just want the symptom to go away because we want to feel better. And, and in a way that's okay because it's alleviating suffering, right? And that is a part of our goal, right? Is to alleviate suffering, is to make people feel better. Um, but there's also a danger in that because if we alleviate suffering by you know, pacifying a symptom, potentially through suppressing that symptom, then we're kind of going down a pathway where we can create more problems, sometimes in the short term, sometimes in the long term. And this is why sometimes, you know, allopathic, allopathic medicine, whether modern or herbal, can be dangerous because it is suppressing the vital force. It's suppressing the vital intelligence, the symptom, of the body. And so in this perspective, we really prefer to look at the symptom as a language, right? A symptom is an intelligent response of the body to an imbalance. It's a communication to us to say, hey, something's off, something's wrong, something's, something needs, we got to do something here. Um, I mean, can you imagine if we didn't have symptoms like if we didn't f if we broke a leg and you t couldn't feel the pain of a broken leg like you would completely destroy your body um you, right it's it's good that we have symptoms because it it protects us in a way and informs us um to do something about it and so a, a really good example that kind of illustrates this dynamic of allopathic suppression versus kind of following the vital force is a fever so you get COVID or you get the, the influenza or whatever thing bugs going around right now. And, and you're, you, you get this pathogen into your body. The brilliance of your immune system responds to that, creates a systemic immunological response. Your higher regulatory centers in your brain, the hypothalamus, read that and say, whoa, we got a pathogen, like red alert, um, we need to do something about it. So the hypothalamus controls your peripheral venting system, the pores of your skin. It says, okay, we're gonna shut the pores down, we're gonna, we're gonna close all the windows of the house, and we're gonna increase the internal temperature to try to cook out this pathogen, right? So we're gonna close all the windows of the doors of the house, and we're gonna turn the furnace on full blast, we're gonna build a big fire in the, in the wood-burning stove, and we're gonna increase that body temperature. And the result is a fever. And that fever is, the, I mean, it's a very sophisticated response. It's a very intelligent, vital response of the body to a perturbation, to a, a, an imbalance, to our um, the homeodynamic balance of the body. It's not, I don't really like the word homeostasis because stasis makes you think it's static, but it's really dynamic. So I like to say homeodynamic or homeodynamis. Anyways, um, so you get a fever, right? Now, fevers don't feel good, right, obviously. Uh, and what's kind of the standard over-the-counter approach to a fever? Well, you take a, a non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drug like an aspirin. And lo and behold, you take the aspirin and your fever goes down and you feel much, much better. What's happening while that fever's down? That bacteria or virus or whatever pathogen is going on is reproducing like the Dickens, right? It is um, proliferating. And as that aspirin wears off, 
your immune system kicks back in, your fever starts to come back, um, you got more pathogen to deal with, right? You're actually more sick than you were before, right? And this is why the suppression of a fever, you know, you can turn a fever, what maybe would be a one, two day fever into a four or five day fever simply by suppressing it with something like an aspirin. And this is how suppression can ultimately drive the sickness deeper into the body and create further problems in the short term and potentially in the long term. Now, shift into our vitalist perspective. Well, I, well, before that, you can actually suppress a fever with herbs too, right? Like you can drink really strong willow bark tea or meadow sweet, and you can suppress that fever too, right? So it's not just the drug thing. It's, it's a, again, it's an approach thing. But we have this wonderful category of herbal medicine that in the West we refer to as diaphoretics. Um, in uh, Chinese medicine, these would commonly be referred to as surface relieving remedies. And what a diaphoretic does, and there's, you know, to get a little more specific, there's two types of diaphoretics, right? So we have our hot, warming, stimulant diaphoretics. Notice the energetics there, right? These are herbs that warm the body up. They stimulate blood flow. They stimulate circulation. They drive the blood to the surface. They actually increase your fever a little bit. You're moving with the vital force, right? You're doing, you're supporting the body and doing what it's already trying to do. And that is an innately vitalist kind of approach. You know, ginger is a really great example of a nice warming pungent, stimulating, diaphoretic type plant. The other types we have are relaxant diaphoretics. These are more relaxed tension in the pores, in the capillary beds, so the blood can reach all the way up to the surface of the skin, open up the pores, and relieve that internal heat through kind of initiating sweating, right? Diaphoretics make you sweat. Uh, elderflower is a classic relaxant diaphoretic used in Western herbalism. And some herbs kind of do both, like yarrow kind of has some stimulant and relaxant diaphoretic properties. So the, as you can see, this is an innately vitalist approach, right? You're moving with the vital force of the body. You're supporting the intelligent uh, language of the body and um, and ultimately help clear fevers significantly more quickly. Um, granted, you typically don't feel as great, um, you know, uh, as you do when you suppress a fever with an aspirin, uh, but ultimately you emerge from that febrile state typically uh, more vital, uh, more strong. You tend to be less worn down and burned out uh, because the disease process is, is sped along a little bit more quickly and, um, and you don't drive it deeper into the body. And so this is what I mean when I say, you know, studying nature uh, ultimately teaches us about how plants function in the human body, how the human body functions, how diseases work. Like we can observe it all around us all the time from, you know, the changing of the seasons. You know, sometimes there's certain, like sometimes people with like arthritic conditions, they can tell when it's going to rain <laughs> uh, because their joint pain flares up and, and it's aggravated by that dampness. That's a very vitalist approach to things, right? It's a damp, and that tells you as an herbalist, oh, we have a damp pattern here in the joints. Some things come and go seasonally. Some things come and go with the weather. Um, we see the, the, the way the and I think this is a core principle in vitalism is we see how nature externally influences our body, our mind, our emotions internally. And this helps to guide us into really having a more holistic knowledge about uh, the interweaving of nature externally and internally and how to effectively use herbal medicine. And so I wanted to share this because to me, the evolutionary herbalist is, I always say this, is that the evolutionary herbalist is first and foremost and forever a student of nature. 
Um, we are students of the external nature and we are students of the internal nature. We are students of the nature of the plants. We are students of the nature of the human body. And we really need to learn to cultivate a mode of perception, a way of seeing things that kind of unlocks the teachings that are all around us, the things that we can really kind of figure out that you don't have to read about it in a book. You don't have to hear someone tell you about it. If you learn to pay attention to nature and understand how plants, even like when I say pay attention to nature, it's like you take a plant, you pay really close attention to what that plant is doing in your body in the moment, as well as over time. Maybe you take a plant every day for three or four weeks in small doses and high doses, and you note, how is your physiology changing? How is your body changing? How do you feel? What, what's, what's different? Uh, what's aggravated, what's alleviated, um, how is it changing the way you're reacting to external circumstances. All of that is is a very vitalist approach. And, and that's really what I mean by um, studying nature. And uh, you'll, you'll find as you continue to hear me just share and teach and consume the content that we offer here at the School of Evolutionary Herbalism, I really am constantly striving to bring everything back to nature because to me, that's what the herbalist does. Like everything in herbal medicine is a reflection of the natural world. And our goal is to really, again, cultivate uh, that that way of seeing things so that we can decipher it, we can unlock that wisdom, and ultimately we can progress down our plant path in a good way. So hopefully you learned something new about vitalism here today. Maybe this is a new concept or maybe it's a concept you're already aware of, but hopefully that gave you a little bit of insight. Uh, to, to me, this is a very central, important, fundamental uh, concept and principle and practice that we utilize here at the School of Evolutionary Herbalism. So hopefully you learned something good. I wanna say thank you to you for making it to the end of this video. It really actually does help with our you know, algorithms and supports the channel. And uh, if you're watching this, Anywhere other than our uh, Plant Path blog, head on over to evolutionaryherbalism.com to check out the rest of our free content, materials, workshops, series, and all of that. And uh, if you're you know, listening on the podcast or watching on YouTube or Instagram, Facebook, hey, help, hit that like button, subscribe button, post a comment. It really does help support the channel so we can continue to uh, produce free content for the herbal medicine community. So once again, thanks so much. I really appreciate you joining me here. And until the next one, take care and be well. <laughs>